Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, our chat meeting. Um, this is our community meeting for Swiss Town Park. Uh, I want to welcome uh, my fellow Swiss Town Park residents. I'm Councilman O'Connor. Um, we're going to go through a brief overview of what's going to happen tonight. Um, there are going to be some Q&A uh, towards the end of this conversation. Um, and I'm going to now pass it off to Dan to explain how the Q&A will get started. And then after that, I'm going to explain where we are in this process, uh, what the general concept and idea for the solar panel uh, or the solar park uh, would look like, as well as uh, the dedication of these, this piece of land back to Frick Park and the trails and the community process that we are going to get into. And this is just the start of it. Um, so, Dan, if you wouldn't mind taking over and just explaining how we're going to do the Q&A after the presentation. Hi there, everyone. Uh, so, uh, we're going to ask that, uh, you know, members of the public uh, hold their questions until uh, the end of our presentation, at which point you will be able to submit your questions either by raising your Zoom hand, obviously, um, you can't raise your actual hand, but you do have the option to raise your hand within Zoom. Um, you will get that option when the uh, Q&A period begins. Um, and you will also have the option if you would rather to not, if you would rather not ask your question live, you can type it into the Q&A. Uh, you will be muted until I go in and unmute you. So um, I'll let you know when you're unmuted and when you're available to, or when it's time to begin speaking and you'll ask your question and uh, we'll respond to it. So uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Councilman O'Connor. Thank you. Um, so some brief history on Somerset phase three, as well as the general timeline and what's going to occur. So Somerset, obviously phase one and phase two have been completed. Um, phase three is looking at about a $22 million gap, um, if not more, in uh, financing. Um, knowing that and knowing that a lot of our residents down here really obviously love the trails, love the park, um, talking to the mayor's office and Mayor Peduto's vision of um, looking at the city in a different approach uh, with the environment uh, as a key element to that. Looking at something that we have a unique opportunity here in Swiss Town Park to be one of, well, actually it would be the first solar farm in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, having this ability with this great piece of property as well as uh, connecting it and expanding Frick Park is something that's really important to all of us. Um, as we know, uh, our park system is something that we all cherish locally. Uh, especially if you live in this area, we have such an easy access to Frick Park and being able to extend the park and allowing for trails to be built to city specs, as well as allowing access back into that uh, area that you're looking at in the bottom of your screen right off of Goodman Street and Love and, and the other adjacent streets there um, really gives us a unique opportunity to uh, do something that has not been done before. Um, and when you're looking at investing in people and the environment, this project makes the most sense. Um, it was brought to my attention maybe about six or eight months ago. I think most residents that I walked into uh, in the neighborhood over that time know what the general plan is. Um, so we are gonna go through the details of what that plan would look like and why this is more feasible for all of us and for our entire system uh, makes a lot of sense to do something like this. I, again, I think it's a very historic uh, opportunity that we have in Swiss Town Park. And I think it's also a great opportunity for those that travel um, to Frick Park to have more of the park uh, available to each and every one of us. Um, as, as I live on the, the end of Goodman Street here, I know that there's a fence. Well, not many of us follow the fence rules. I know I, I go around myself. Uh, to take a walk in the mornings with my dog. So um, it's something that we all want to have access to. And I think that's what we gather from a number of community conversations. 
So what's going to happen through this process? We're obviously going to go through a presentation for the URA because if you don't know, the land is actually owned by the Urban Redevelopment Authority of the city of Pittsburgh. After that, there is going to be, after this community conversation, there is going to be an RFP, which is a request for proposal. That's going to go out hopefully before the end of the year. After that, we are going to convene a total of three more community meetings. Now that's gonna get into a lot of detail. Uh, we've done this with Hayes Woods when we took that over to turn it into a park as well. It is anywhere from where the trails are going to be, where the solar farms are going to be, um, where parking is going to uh, be able to uh, access these trails. I've already heard from residents that live along uh, the, the bank of phase three that we don't want a ton of cars showing up. That's not the plan. I believe, you know, I'm just sort of spitballing this, but where everybody parks off of commercial will remain and possibly could expand a little bit because the whole thought is not to have people parking in the neighborhood, taking up parking spots for residents, but allowing people access to enjoy the trails. So all of that is going to be part of a longer conversation that needs to happen, uh, as well as when we're talking about the solar farm and where it's going to be located and how the energy go or how the, the energy goes to the grid and then how we can tap into that grid to get energy into our own homes that live down here right adjacent to it. So there's a lot of conversation that still has to happen. We just wanted to get this out as quick as we could, have this open conversation about what's going to happen, hear from uh, our fellow neighbors and residents, because again, this is a very unique opportunity for all of us. So I'm going to pass it to Lily, who's gonna go through the URA portion of the presentation. And then after that, we are going to get to as many uh, questions and comments as we possibly can. As uh, Dan mentioned, if you do have questions towards the end, you can put it in the chat as well. I'm going to pass it to Lily again. Thank everybody for being here. I think this is the start of a really unique project that we have a great opportunity to do in the city and especially in our neighborhood. Thanks so much, Councilman O'Connor. And thank you everyone else for joining us this evening. Um, welcome to the Swiss Elm Park Solar Community Meeting. Uh, to get us started here on the URA side, uh, I'd just like to do a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Lily Friedman. I'm a project manager at the URA. Uh, joining me from the URA team will be Ma Paul Martinchech. Uh, Paul, would you like to do a quick introduction? Yeah, sure. Hi, Paul Martinchek with um, the, the uh, engineering department of the URA. Um, and I'll be working on the, you know, the technical aspects of the project um, with our consultants and designers. Thanks, Paul. Um, all right, we can move along to the next couple of slides. Um, we've got Daniel on the back end here helping us out, out with the, the tech. So thank you, Daniel, for being here. Um, and if you want to keep moving one more. Um, yeah, so as we've been, you know, preparing for this meeting today, um, we have gotten a lot of questions about, you know, why solar on this site? Um, and I think, you know, at the URA, we're always working to think of new ways to build upon the city of Pittsburgh's P4 initiative. For those of you who aren't familiar, you can see on the slide here that P4 is a model for urban growth that centers on innovation, inclusive, and in, uh, sustainable development by way of people, planet, place, and performance. Um, so from what we understand, the city of Pittsburgh's environmental challenges, including air and water quality, related in part to a change in climate and in part to our industrial history, um, you know, aren't traditionally what the URA's redevelopment toolbox um, is designed to address. However, when thinking about how our access to land here could be part of the solution, clean energy generation came to mind. Um, as we know, locally produced clean energy helps clean our air and as a result, improves public health. Um, further, you know, the idea of remediating a slag dump, a physical reminder of our industrial past into a solar farm, um, which we hope will be a symbol of a clean energy future in Pittsburgh seemed like the right direction. Uh, just today, actually, in a discussion focused on spurring regional energy and economic transformation in the Ohio River Valley and Upper Appalachia, I learned the term bright field, which is a term that defines the remediation of a brownfield site 
um, into solar development. Um, and that's what we're looking to do here. We believe it's time for the URA to play a bigger role in being a part of that energy and economic transformation uh, to come for the region. Next slide, please. So talking a little bit about the site here, um, you know, this is an old picture, as some of you will notice, you know, on the hillside, it's very kind of greened in at this point. Um, but I want to draw your attention to these two flat cleared areas. Um, the, the lower area uh, used to be a former um, ball field, and the upper area was a um, radio station tower. And so these two spaces are going to be the best um, places for solar. Our estimates show that it's about 13 acres between the two of them. Um, and that's really what we have our, our sites set on. Uh, for those of you who traverse the land frequently, um, like Councilman O'Connor himself, it, it seems like, um, we we know that you know there are a lot of kind of very sloped areas that really this picture doesn't do a good a great job of representing um but those those are the areas that are a little bit you know less feasible so really we have our sites set on these flattened parts right here um and daniel if you want to go to the next slide uh paul i'm gonna pull you into to describe a little bit about the remediation plan for the site as it exists Yeah, sure. So, you know, is these our original plan of the um, of the uh, remediation would be to regrade was regrading the site to form the the neighborhoods and then capping that with you know soil with the streets um, and ultimately with housing. Um, as as we move forward with this plan, we would be doing a lot less uh, grading. You know, we're looking more towards having these these flat areas and probably not as much advantage to um, regrading that, although we will consider, you know, be looking at those options. Um, another component of that um, plan would have required uh, taking down a lot of, um, a lot of trees, a lot of mature trees and, and tree stands, which now the city's taking a different look at that in terms of our urban forest and, and preserving that. So under this plan, we would be preserving, um, you know, most of that urban forest, if not just about all of it, um, without having to interrupt that, and then and converting that urban forest to the to the parklands and having paths through it. Um, so, in, in terms of the remediation, really, it's um, it's capping the the slag, um, and then so in stormwater management. So we we would we would be putting in green energy type features, um, probably things like you know meadows, uh, bioswales, things like that for. Um, you know, collecting and detaining uh, stormwater before it reaches the, the creek. Um, and also with the capping and the, the treatment through green infrastructure, um, we, would, we would have better water quality that's actually reaching the stream. Right now, as the water goes through the, the slag, um, that pH increases or that alkalinity um, and um, degrades that water quality. Um, you know, the, the first phase is already demonstrating with the, that the, the a much improved um, water quality in Nine Mile Run, as everybody can see. And of course, that's, that's been coupled with the Nine Mile Run uh, remediation. So this is the next phase of that Nine Mile Run, um, you know, remediation improvements to the, the uh, watershed. I think that about explains it. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, so I want to talk a little bit now about what the development process will be. Um, so thus far, we've gotten a lot of feedback that, you know, it feels like this is happening a little bit fast. Um, and so I think we're here, part of the reason we're here today is to explain, you know, what, it, what this process is going to look like moving forward and really to help folks understand that this is just the beginning of the process here. Um, and so what we intend to do um, with this site is to release, hope, we're hoping by the end of the year, so in December of 2021, um, a what we call a devel development request for proposals or RFP. And so this is a request for developers or development teams, in this case, solar developers, uh, to submit a proposal to, do, to redevelop publicly owned property, in this case, two URA parcels. Um, a proposal may include a number of different areas, um, pieces of information, depending on the type. Some of them are listed below um, on the screen for folks who are interested. Um, and essentially, 
you know, we will review responses to this, these proposals to um, make, you know, a decision about the best developer to, to redevelop um, the site. Uh, Daniel, you can move along to the next slide. Um, and so a little bit about the development process um, or the review process. What we'll do is we'll convene um, what we call a development RFP review committee. And so a review committee, it typically, um, you know, includes a number of different folks from the community, um, from the city, as well as URA staff. Um, and we'll, they'll be selected to compare proposals based upon the project concept, budget, timeline, and other information provided on the, on the slide before. Ultimately, the review committee uh, would select the most qualified developer in the best project for the site. Next slide, please. So I wanna spend a little bit of time on, on talking about the timeline. Um, so as I mentioned before, you know, this is the very beginning of the process. And so you can see here, um, quarter three, 2021, here we are all together at the Swiss Elm Park Solar Community Meeting number one. And so the goals of today, as Councilman O'Connor uh, laid out for us a little bit earlier, was to um, you know, talk through what folks are interested in seeing in the RFP. We wanna hear from the community on what's important for you to be a part of the proposal, uh, the request for a proposal itself. So as we write that up at the URA um, and send it out for folks to respond to, we're looking for community feedback at this time to, to ensure that we can have community voice as part of that RFP. Um, so that's where we are today, really beginning the conversation, talking about this change of direction formally away from Somerset phase three to this Swiss Elm Park solar project um, with the goal of preparing to write up the RFP um, and release it, you know, at the end of the year. So we intend to come back to the community multiple times throughout this process. I want to be very clear in that this is not going to be the only time to provide feedback. Um, so initially, you know, we'll be meeting today. We can take at the end of this meeting, um, you know, through the Q&A by raising your hand, uh, we'll be taking questions here. I also want to mention to folks who might want to give feedback anonymously that um, in the chat here, we've got a feedback form, um, which I encourage folks to not only, you know, fill out yourself, um, whether you plan to comment Q&A um, in the meeting itself, but also to share with folks, um, share with your neighbors, share with other folks. Um, the goal is really to get as many, um, as, as much feedback as possible to inform the process. Um, so, so that's where we are today, community meeting one. Community meeting two, um, once we have the RFP um, put together, we intend to come back to the community to share what we're gonna be asking for, um, to you know, give another opportunity for the community to feedback, give feedback on the RFP before it, prior to its release. Um, after that meeting, you know, we'll plan to uh, release the RFP again. December 2021 is the goal, um, with a close in, in quarter one of 2022. So moving into next year, year already, time is flying as always. Um, we will be closing the RFP, convening the review committee that I defined um, a few slides prior, including um, what we hope to be a short list of developers. Um, so depending on how many folks respond, we will, um, you know, create a short list, which means, you know, the ones that we feel are the best candidates, in which case we'll likely return to the community with those best candidates um, to see which the community thinks is the best, to receive comments from the community on, you know, what, what feels like the best fit for the Swiss Elm Park neighborhood. Um, so that brings us to community meeting three. And then right after that, you know, we'll be in quarter three of 2022 already. Um, and that's where the review committee will really come together to pick that ultimate developer, um, the, the chosen, you know, proposal that will be intended to move forward in this process, um, at which point we will intend to return to the community for what we're calling community meeting four here or the pre-final design community meeting, uh, whereby you know, that, developer, that, that developer will um, share their plan for the site, 
um, proposed plan, at which point the community will have another opportunity to respond um, to that proposal. And hopefully, you know, that developer, having been at community meeting three, will be able to respond to questions there and kind of create some iterative improvements to their plan before returning back to the, the community for meeting number four. Um, we have listed here in 2023 quarter run one, the targeted project start date. Um, this is very ambitious. Um, we're putting here as it here as the goal. Um, it'll be likely quarter one or quarter two of, of 2023. Um, so that's a little bit of what the timeline looks like. Um, Daniel, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, and so here we are, folks, that's really the close of the presentation today. Um, and really, we're hoping for the rest of this meeting, we can take the time to hear from, hear from you, hear from, you know, what um, kind of scares you about this concept, what's exciting, um, what, you know, you have concerns about, questions, you know, this is the time where we want to hear from you. Um, and to reiterate Daniel's comments earlier in the meeting, um, we hope that folks will use that raise hand function. So on your Zoom kind of panel or ribbon, um, there should be a function that says raised hand, at, at which point um, Daniel will be able to unmute you and you can ask your question. So uh, there is one, or there are a number of questions that were submitted uh, via the Q&A in the chat. The first question came from, uh, hold on just a moment, I gotta scroll up here. My computer is always freezing up at inopportune times. <laughs> no uh, problem, Daniel. Is it Mike, a question from Mike Roth? Yes. Okay. Um, how big of solar panel, or how big of a solar POV or PV array would you hope to build? Is there a rough estimate of kilowatts of capacity? Yeah, sure. So in, in talking about um, those flat areas, which are really going to be the most ideal portion of the site to build, um, we believe that there's about 13 um, acres within those portions. Um, and so really, I think 13 to 20 is kind of that sweet spot of acreage that we're trying to get to. Um, and that would give us about three to five megawatts of power. Okay, um, another question. Um, how accessible will these areas be for the public? Walkers, mountain bikers, if we go with a solar panel plant? Yeah, so I think this is a really good question. And one of the things that we're trying to flush out um, in this you know, RFP process so I think that the way we see it um, kind of flushing out at this time is that the flattened areas where the solar panels actually will be, will be closed off to the public. So those, those there won't be, um, there will be no accessibility in that area for the public. However, um, you know, that's 13 acres, 13 to 20 acres, you know, I mentioned is kind of the, the sweet spot for solar feasibility. Um, and in the property, the two parcels that we're speaking of here, there are 70 acres of land, just about. So the way we're envisioning it is that part of the site, that part that's perfect for solar, um, especially will be kind of closed off to the public, uh, used for solar panels. And then the rest of the site is where we're really considering that um, expansion of Frick Park or recreational space um, for use from the public. And in terms of accessibility, you know, for folks who use the site now, um, it is really blocked off, obviously not private land, not accessible. Um, and I think one of the goals for this meeting is to understand, you know, how can that accessibility factor um, be kind of designed to its greatest potential? So where from the street grid are you interested in seeing maybe more formal pathways um, to the recreational portion of the site? Um, and so, so yeah, that, those are some of the things that we don't have the perfect answers for now, but again, this is just the beginning of the conversation. I think we'll have a much better sense of that once we get kind of, you know, more feedback from the community, um, see the responses to the feedback form in, in the chat, et cetera. Okay. Um... Jen Damon asks, I, and I'm going to add, um, we'll switch to, we have one live question. I'll read this question. We'll switch to live question, and then I'll continue reading from the Q&A. 
Uh, Jen Damon wants to know, I want a seat on the review committee. Where do I submit my standing interest experience slash qualifications to do so? I also want to know if drafts of the RFP will be published for, re for revisions or amendments for contributions and additions. I, I guess that prior to, you know, it actually being released for bids. Lily, can I, can I just jump in on the review committee? I've also gotten some texts from some neighbors that want to be involved in this. Um, I would say um, there's no committee that's been from the neighborhood set up yet. Um, so if you are interested in helping through this process, um, obviously there, there are also some questions there and the construction of the bridge is going to uh, obviously be an issue for all of us. And so we have to look at that timeline. Um, construction may coincide while we're building trails as well as placing the, the solar panels in the area. But just so everybody knows, this is gonna be more open for our residents to use this and building new trails from the city and putting money in the capital budget. This is gonna be a long process. I would say if you are interested uh, in forming, maybe it's every three blocks, we have a couple people that represent. Um, if you wouldn't mind sending an email to my office, um, I'll give you my email as well as there's a district five feedback if you look this up on the website uh, and just give us that background as to where you live and then maybe we could do, like I said, maybe coordinate a couple neighbors at a time from each block or something like that. Um, but my email is corey.oconnor at pittsburghpa.gov. Um, you could also reach out. Uh, I don't know if we can send those types of messages on the chat, but that would be how I think we need to structure it. If everybody who lived in this area before Somerset even came available phase one, there were committees set up for Swiss Town Park when that discussion happened. So I see us doing more of those committees as well. And, and again, coordinating, I, I see that question a lot on here about commercial. Uh, that's going to be a huge lift and probably something that has to go into the RFP about construction time when PennDOT's doing that mass uh, construction of building a new bridge over Commercial Street as well. Thank you. Okay, we're going to pivot quickly to two live questions, first from Susan Neft and then from Alan Lasky. I apologize if I didn't pronounce your names correctly. Um, Susan, you are now able to speak um, and uh, you can unmute yourself. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I was, I was uh, worried about all the animals that we have in this area and, um, you know, how, how free the area was, was going to be for them to be able to live around here. Um, I was also wondering if uh, you know of any local solar developers that you might uh, approach. And uh, I'm not sure that this is, this could relate to it at all, but, um, Will this have anything to do with the flooding that we have uh, with storms on commercial under, under the bridge right now? Great, thank you. Um, so first off, you know, on your question about animals, just a quick question about your question. Did you mean um, like pets that from people in the neighborhood or animals that, you know, live in Frick Park? Um, could you just clarify that please for me? Maybe we lost her. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I would just say that, that the impact on, there is a lot of wildlife uh, that we see in our backyards down here a lot. So um, I think that's a big concern in how we do this project, um, how they are impacted throughout this, this, this building of the grids, which is kind of in the open space. I think when it comes to trails, there are some that already exist. And I think, um, you know, to build those out shouldn't impact uh, too much of the native land that's already there. Um, I think it's more the open space that you're seeing. So hopefully uh, none of that, uh, you know, the foxes, the deer, the groundhog that, that we have in our area, I don't believe that they would be affected 
um, by this because we're using some open space, not really chopping any trees down or getting into any of the forest, uh, leaving the grid or leaving the grid, leaving the, the, the Frick Park area that it already exists. Okay. Yeah, I can just follow up on that. Um, so, I mean, our intention is to um, form the access road in a way that is going to be like as minimally destructive to the local ecology as possible. So minimal disruption um, to the existing flora and fauna at, at this time. Um, again, if, if you're referring to like folks pets, then we imagine that, you know, the walking trails that will be formally provided will be a much better recreational opportunity um, for folks who enjoy the area for, you know, dog walking and that type of thing. Um, as for local developers, there are a few folks that we are really hoping are going to respond to the RFP that are from Pittsburgh, from the area. Um, and that really, that, that would mean a lot, I think, to have, have a local developer be able to um, initially be the one chosen for this site. So, so yeah, I, we definitely have some folks that we're hoping that will respond locally. Um, and, and yeah, we're, we're looking forward to seeing, you know, what comes in from local developers. Um, as for the stormwater um, issues along commercial, um, you know, based on our goals to be kind of like minimally destruct destructive to the existing, um, you know, forests, trees, um, environment, I don't see this causing a negative impact. Um, as far as, you know, the, the land that Councilman O'Connor mentioned is already flat where we're kind of proposing this. Um, some of the meadow mixes that Paul actually talked about earlier in terms of the, the remediation process, um, I think we'll actually may have the opportunity to create a richer ecology in those 13 acres than, than what is there right now. Um, so, so part of that remediation process will allow for um, other kind of plantings to go beneath the solar panels. Um, and so I think there, there is potential to improve, you know, the, the ability of those 13 acres to be able to, to soak up um, rain. Um, although again, I'm, I'm not sure how much that will affect the area down below in commercial. I think it's, it's maybe a little too, too early to speak to that. Yeah, the, so the, the stormwater, as Lily says, I mean, it's probably minimal in the, in the, in the tailwater effect rather than the up, upstream watershed. It is one of the largest uh, watersheds in the city um, in the nine mile run and most of that's you know impacted from the developed areas upstream of the you know commercial road um, so I was, there, there, there'd be some mitigation but probably not that much that's noticeable when you see that the water you know the water coming from from upstream and we're in the downstream area thank you thank you welcome sure. Okay, uh, Alan, uh, you it's have the... It, yes, it's actually Vivian Lasky. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm on that. his iPad. <laughs> okay, yeah. I actually have, I have several questions. I don't know if you want to limit it to one or two, but I have three or four questions. Um, the first one would be, um, where is the funding for this and who is going to own the facility and is it going to be hooked into a local utility? I didn't really understand. That's one question. Second one was, I do live in Somerset at Frick Park. And I wondered if in the plans we're going to be shown what it would look like from this side of the valley. Uh, what, you know, it's just, um, you know, wondering what these look like, you know, from this end. And the last question would be, I missed a little bit of the very beginning and I wasn't clear about, you're talking about a bridge. Is that part of the project? Would that definitely be like a bridge from Somerset across Nine Mile Run and leading up to these areas that will have some paths. So those are my several questions. Yeah, I think I can take these. So, um, hey, Paul, real quick. Yeah. Um, we've had uh, multiple questions of a similar ilk on these subjects. So um, I believe Talia O'Brien asked a similar question. JBC asked a similar question. Uh, Nick asked a similar question. Um, and there were several others that I identified, but basically, uh, who, where is this power going to be going to? Uh, 
can people in the or people in the surrounding areas going to benefit directly from that power and the questions about the bridge i hope that didn't uh, uh, okay so quickly uh, wait question. sorry paul before you got started daniel if you're able to could you um direct back to the slide that's titled how do solar panels deliver clean energy is that am i going up or down um that would be up so back towards the beginning okay There you go. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Okay, yeah, so the, 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 the solar power will link into the grid. Uh, there, is a, there is a major power line that runs a, across the ridge just up um, you know, the top of the bank at the Monongahela River there. Um, so, we, so we would have an ideal spot to just kind of link, link right into the grid and that would add the power you know, locally. Um, just how that works as, as far as if you can sign on to the green energy um, company providing this, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure on all those logistics. I mean, that would be kind of your approach, I, I guess, to benefit from this and other green energy initiatives is to actually sign on with the green energy provider. Um, the bridge we're talking about is the, the replacement of the 376 bridge that goes over um, commercial road there, you know, through the valley and into the tunnel. Um, so the, the PennDOT plan is to build a um, bridge structure um, parallel and beside the existing bridge, completely, completely build the bridge, and then in a short amount of time, close, close the highway, drop the existing bridge, roll the other, the new bridge into place and, and connect it into service. That's the bridge we're talking about. So as far as the bridge that was in the plan to connect phase two to two and three, you know, across from the existing over would not be constructed under this plan. Um, that is also one of the hurdles as far as the, the cost of the project in, in that connectivity. Um, but though it's a nice idea um, for redundancy through the area and transportation, um, it's, it, it's tough to fund and justify considering all the other, you know, transportation and infrastructure improvement needs that the city has. Um, what was part, Vivian, uh, another the part funding, the funding was part of it. Who was funding it, and also uh, would we be able to see a mock-up of it of what it would look like from? Yeah, this, uh, okay, that's the other two. Mm -hmm. So the funding, uh, we're still working on those those arms to that. I think Lily can talk a little to that. Um, and the last part, definitely, that's where we're going through this process. One is to get the input from the community on what you'd like to see holistically, you know, in a conceptual sense, and where the connections are what the needs are, what you see, you know, the recreational aspects and your concerns. And then we start formulating those plans. And as we see that in that meeting three, we would, we would be bringing in the, you know, the conceptual designs that would show where that would be. That would include the renderings, um, plans, um, things like that, even uh, maybe even interactive three, three dimensional transfer through. I know these the programs, the designers are pretty slick these days. And then we would see in plan four, we would be at that what we'd call like about a 90% design and then start looking at the details on, on where the uh, community concerns are on how those, those last pieces of the pie fit in together. Thank you. Yeah, and I might jump, just jump in, Paul, to, to mention that the URA is intending to continue to the own this land long term. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. this RFP will be a long term lease. Um, and in some of our due diligence, you know, even understanding feasibility of this concept and whatnot, from what we understand about um, like economic sustainability for solar developers is that they would need to be generating solar for around 30 to 40 years. So we're looking at a, a long-term lease um, at about that length, um, depending on you know, the developer that is chosen. But the idea being that um, the URA will continue to own the land throughout the entirety of that process. Um, and you know, at which time at the end of that 40 year lease period, um, we can make a decision about whether you know, we wanna continue um, with the solar or um, choose another direction for the site. Um, to that end, I believe we didn't really cover your, your funding question, um, but the idea there would be that the solar developer 
um, would fund, you know, the development of the solar panels on site. Um, from what, again, some of those like initial feasibility conversations, um, the URA will still be responsible for the remediation of the land as it exists now, um, which we already have funding through um, through the TIF as related to um, Somerset. So um, we, you know, that part of it is already already funded and, and that's TIF stands for tax increment financing. Um, I know we get a lot of acronyms thrown around, so I just wanted to um, mention that. But but we will be looking for a developer to fund the um, you know the solar panels and the some of the infrastructure on site needed to um, to make the the solar panel concepts uh, come to fruition. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, we're going to go back to uh, the Q and A. We've got quite a number of questions here. And so I'm going to do my best to sort of consolidate questions that are asking approximately the same thing into, um, you know, single questions so that um, Thank it you, Daniel. just makes it easier to organize our thoughts. Uh, no, you're a wizard with this, Daniel. We appreciate that. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that too. Um, so I think we talked a little bit about where the power or what the power is going to be used for, but who would benefit? Um, and this is a question from JBC, who would benefit from the power slash credit slash buyback, buyback costs from the power generated? Or is that too early? I, and this is me editorializing, or do we not know that yet? So Paul, I don't know if you want to jump in here, but my take is that, you know, the consumer will benefit from, um, you know, being able to have a clean energy, more clean energy options um, via their local, you know, energy provider. Um, and I, I would also argue that, you know, in, in theorizing about solar development in the city more generally, um, you know, we're all benefiting from this in that what, you know, really holds back our city in terms of air quality is really the generation of um, energy from, you know, not clean sources. So from, um, you know, coal powered energy plants um, that are still in the surrounding region and affecting our air quality today. So I think a lot of times we talk about in Pittsburgh, you know, oh, our history and industry is what causes you know, the asthma that you're seeing around you or, um, you know, those alerts on your phone that say it's a it's a bad day to go outside because of the air quality isn't good enough. Um, and so I think that from our perspective, you know, solar energy is a way to um, mitigate, you know, those issues that we're seeing in public health um, and environmental, you know, quality of life here in the city. Um, and I think there's also, you know, an equity component to that. Um, you know, we know that black and brown communities in the city of Pittsburgh suffer from higher asthma rates um, or in the hospital more due to, um, you know, issues with the air quality. And so I think that, you know, there are there are ways that, of course, this is one piece of land, but I think it's part of the larger the larger solution to some of these environmental issues that are affecting public health for all of us. And a lot of times the most vulnerable communities um, in, in our city. Mm. Paul, I don't know if you want to add on anything there. Uh, no, that, that's a good answer. I, I think there was, um, just looking on, there was another question you know, related to that was, you know, what's the, the plan for more solar in the city? And um, I'd say, you know, all of our, our projects, we're looking for those opportunities. We have a parking garage that um, we're just starting construction. I know bad word, parking garage, but um, still kind of a necessary, car still being necessary transportation, but at the Pittsburgh Technology Center, and we're putting a, um, a solar array on there. I so I don't remember off the top of my head what that's going to generate. There was another question as far as how many kind of getting an idea of five, what five megawatts would be. And I don't have that answer readily. Unless I can Google that real quick here. Daniel, if you want to keep going um, on the question. And maybe uh, I can keep the next one going as, as Paul um, is trying to find an example for us of what that might look like. Uh, 
I've got a question here. I don't know if this is like something similar because I'm unfortunately not a solar power expert, but um, who would be the off taker of the solar energy? Is that asking um, Mike, who would take that to the energy market or is that a more technical term than that? Um, in terms of off taker, um, I guess I would say that the, the solar panels um, or the developer who is developing the solar on site um, will be sending you know, that energy that is derived directly to the utility at which point um, you know, any consumer of electricity can choose um, to buy into solar or clean energy sources rather than um, the alternative. So um, does that answer the question? Paul, would you would you add anything there? Or? Yeah, and that's and that's part of the proposal process too, just um, getting that logistics on you know how this is, but essentially they will be a power producer, you know, on a small scale, produce that and essentially sell that to the grid. Um, and then you know, we would collect rent for the the property, which then we can reinvest back into the city and to, you know, to other to you know more more projects. Um, I did a quick quick study, and if whatever I read was right, one megawatt will power about 100 houses. So if we're somewhere in that five megawatt range, then you know 500 houses, which you know pretty pretty fair size, maybe even the what almost the size of Swiss Home Park. Yeah, and I might also just like texture the response here a little bit when talking about like from my understanding, you know, um, so community solar is kind of another alternative versus sending the energy directly to the grid. Um, and I know that there is some legislation um, currently in PA that is hoping to push forward, um, you know, the ability for folks to develop community solar. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not ready to go yet. Um, so I think that poses some challenges for developers to want to consider that. And when I say community, community solar, you know, that might look more like when we're talking about community solar, that, that might look like, oh, any of the kind of homes within that, you know, within a certain radius of the, um, the solar panels might be able to get, get energy directly from those panels. And so that's a little bit different of a system, obviously. Um, and I think that for this proposal, we're um, you know, based on kind of the legislation that hasn't been passed yet and some of those items, um, we're, we're considering that option a little bit less. I think it's a little bit less financially feasible for the developer. Um, and so with all that in mind, um, you know, the, I think the, the most sustainable versus, you know, ec economically um, and therefore environmentally um, sustainable is to consider the option of sending the energy dir most directly to the grid, because I think that um, based on our kind of political climate and where the, the uh, community solar legislation is now, I think that that's, that's what's going to make the most sense uh, for this site. Okay, we're going to go back to uh, some live questions. And I saw something in the chat that says, Video is working, but audio isn't. Please turn on audio. I'm not sure who that's directed at. Um, if there's an issue with audio, um, I believe that question was from Erica. Could you please uh, let us know more in the chat, Erica? I'm not seeing anything um, indicative of an issue on our end, but you know it's Zoom, so. <laughs> there may very well be an issue on your end. So uh, let us know what's going on and we'll see what we can do to help. That said, uh, we've got two questions in, um, uh, live questions, one from Abe. Uh, Abe, go ahead and ask your question uh, now. Um, yep. And then we'll go to Talia. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, Abe. Great. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to point out that, that mountain biking in this section of the slags is a major asset for the community. Or it's, it, well, mountain biking in general is an asset for community health 
as well as the livability of the city. Um, and people travel from out of state to ride the trails of Crick Park, as well as the trails around the slags. Um, so I guess I have three questions that I wanted to ask. Um, and all three are sort of uh, my concern that's related to the impact on these mountain biking trails. Uh, the first question is, will there be any development on the southern or the south facing slope that faces Homestead? Um, question two is, have you considered elevated solar panels that would allow access below? Um, an example of this is over by the Frick Environmental Center where there are solar panels above a parking lot and um, it's, it allows the space to be accessible. Um, I, I'm not suggesting a parking lot on the slags, but um, potentially elevating the solar panels and allowing trails beneath the solar panels. And question three is, have you reached out to Trail Pittsburgh as a subject matter expert? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we know that there's a huge mountain biking community um, that enjoys these trails. And my dad is one of them. Um, and he always says that these are some of the best biking trails in like the entire country. And he's he's definitely a huge fan. So I'm glad to hear that he's not the only one out there um, who's who's definitely enjoying them. Um, but as far as you know, the slopes go. Um, it, it gets, from what we understand and some of our, you know, efforts on, on determining the feasibility of this site more generally for, for solar, um, it is possible to do solar on the slopes. However, it is more expensive and more difficult from like an engineering perspective. Um, so those areas are definitely not going to be ideal for the solar concept. Um, and again, it will depend upon what we get back with proposals for the for the RFP, but from what we understand more generally, um, you know, that those areas aren't, um, you know, aren't as financially, they don't make as much sense in terms of expenses to develop them. Um, and so it's, it's less likely, you know, that a developer might choose that area. Um, as for the elevated panels, um, I have seen those um, before, and I definitely think yeah, that, that could be very interesting to create kind of like a, I guess, basically roof, almost like roof, feeling like the trails have kind of a roof over top of them. Um, I think that I can't necessarily speak to the feasibility of that in terms of what it might look like um, for a developer to manage the operations while having kind of public trails beneath them. Um, I, I imagine things could get a little bit messy there, but again, I think until we have a proposal and a developer that we're working with, um, we can't kind of answer that in, in a finite way um, right now. As far as Trail Pittsburgh goes, um, in you know working on this site for a long period of time, we have engaged a number of different like trail stakeholders. Um, I think that as the conversation moves forward in terms of really nailing down the areas in which um, the kind of formal trail should be developed, um, that will be an absolute like necessity. And so I'm glad that you mentioned it and I'll definitely ensure that they're kind of like as part of our, our stakeholder map um, for this area. That being said, I think the first step for us is to really engage the developer, understand the land that's needed, um, to kind of make the solar concept happen, you know, the entry road, um, you know, some of those, those factors around the development of the solar, I think are step one to understand. And it's, and then we'll kind of be able to, to frame around that the best places for, for the trails um, and engaging tra Trail Pittsburgh and other folks, you know, I think will be, will be definitely important in that effort. Um, Abe, I'm curious about your um, experience mountain biking up there. In your mind, are the most, um, like, are the best trails for mountain biking on those slopes? Is that why you asked that? Or is it, are there some, I know there are some like jumps and whatnot in the flat areas. Are those still like, does that feel like an asset that would be lost? Um, I, well, I'm maybe a little biased and say that any trail that's taken away is an asset lost. Um, I would say that the, the south facing slopes do have some of the best trails back there, um, uh -huh. slightly more technical. Um, but for, be for beginners who are like just starting out, there are some nice flat trails that are 
on that uh, flat section that is being considered for the solar panels. So, um, but yeah, like I said, I'm a little biased and I think any trail lost is sort of a lost asset for the community. Got it, thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Talia O'Brien. Uh, Talia, you have the floor and you can... Uh, Hi. Speaking. Hello. Um, Hi there. I would like to echo Abe's sentiments um, highly. Um, those trails back there and the jumps that you mentioned are a decade old institution in this neighborhood that serves as a huge attraction to the neighborhood. And it will be very devastating to a lot of the community members to see them gone uh, or altered in any way. But primarily, I'm just wondering, as Susie Neft put it, um, I don't see how any of this is going to benefit any of the community members at all that it will be direct, directly affecting. Can you answer that any more specifically? I know someone asked that question, but I didn't really hear much of a directed answer at how it will benefit the people yeah. that. Besides, besides subscribing through Duquesne Light or your energy provider. Which will not reduce costs. I mean, it, yeah. the solar community is the only way that it will. Right. So um, I can definitely speak to the community benefit here. So again, just to talk through some of the numbers on acreage for these two properties. Um, so there's 13 acres are the flat lands here. Um, and between the two, the two parcels that are in question, we have about 70 acres of land. So those are our, our kind of estimates that we have right now. Um, and so we imagine that, you know, that being said, about potentially, you know, half of the space, um, you know, again, these are like estimated numbers. We're going to have to dive into the details um, a, a little bit later on in the process. But um, so we see what is now like illegal trails um, that are that are private property. Um, and also, uh, you know, what we envision at front, taking on the liability as the landowner, um, it has been a safety hazard in the past. Um, and continues to be something that from like a public safety perspective, we worry about people on these trails. Um, and so I think that from our perspective, you know, part of this project is the solar, um, right? And so again, I might mention that, you know, the solar creating clean energy in the city has impacts for the air quality and environmental, you know, assets for the city. Um, as opposed to the alternative. So I guess that would be A, with the solar itself, and B, with the rest of the property, which, you know, as we're, we're kind of fleshing out this concept, would be um, slated to be, you know, public trails rather than private trails for the community, um, as well as having an access road to that space built as part of the solar development, which will enable folks to more safely use these areas for recreation legally. Um, so, so I know that, you know, it's been used illegally for, for a long time. And so that doesn't feel like any value added, but I think in our minds, you know, having a safer way to access the space, um, you know, maintain trails by, by the city, um, as well as kind of that, you know, that, that feeling of, oh, you know, if, if something were to happen, if I were to get, you know, in a bike accident, which has happened on the site in the past, um, you know, there are access roads in which, you know, the authorities or an ambulance or, you know, someone might be able to get me where I need to go safely. And so I think that that's an asset that this site does not have right now. Um, it's definitely something that really scares us as property owners, as well as just stewards of, you know, a community space in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, we really worry about that happening on this land. Um, and so I think that those are some of the benefits that we see for this site. Um, Lily, can I just add um, on the solar community solar uh, fully supportive if we can uh, get the state I believe Council we may have done a will of Council on this before I see that was part of the question. Um, but fully supportive of that uh, we can write letters we can support. We can go to our state reps, our state senators, um, and we do still have some time to figure all of these issues out. Uh, but to keep it within the neighboring communities would be our ultimate goal. 
um, and talking to the mayor, that was the, the overall plan. So obviously we will fight to get some uh, relief from the state uh, for some community solar as well. So we do have some time for that, but very supportive of community solar. Uh, as I know the mayor's office is, and my fellow council members would be, I, I would hope as well as our state reps and state senators. So that is an ongoing conversation that we'll have. Yeah, and I know it's something that we're watching too at the URA. Um, and I also on the community solar front, um, again, like that would be a very exciting concept. And I guess what I'm hearing from this comment is that that might feel like it's a little bit more community benefit if you know, the, the neighboring residents could get um, energy kind of directly from these panels. Um, and I will say like one more thing I might mention on this is on that initial initial feasibility kind of conversations that we've been having is there are ways to build into like the lease agreement or, um, you know, the when we're when we're developing the site that would allow us to transition into that should this kind of legislation be passed within the next year or two years or within you know what that 40 year lease might look like so all that to say that we're developed the rfp will be released with with this kind of thought thinking in mind but there is absolutely room within that language like in the legal language of the lease in developing the space to be able to um, ensure that when or if that legislation is passed that makes the community solar concept more feasible for this area um, we can pivot the way the operations are, um, you know, working, we can potentially pivot um, in that direction. So I think that, again, it's a little bit early now, um, but I just want to ensure that folks understand that when it is kind of, if, if it becomes a political atmosphere in, in which that is more feasible for this area, um, you know, it won't be too late to consider that if we go this direction now. All right, thank you for the direct responses. Um, I wasn't here during the tree conversation, but I would like to plug Tree Pittsburgh and highly recommend you reaching out to them with any and all questions and concerns involving trees in this area. They are the experts in Pittsburgh on the subject matter. Yeah, I, I don't know if that came up earlier, but yeah, Tree Pittsburgh actually, um, Marty Eisler, who's the head of the Urban Coalition in Squirrel Hill, um, and our tree tender, uh, Lisa, or forestry director, sorry, uh, Lisa Chaffee did do uh, a tour of the park, I want to say last summer. Um, and there are some areas that uh, Tree Pittsburgh and, and those organizations are very concerned with. And that is part of the outline and part of the residents that will be involved in these conversations. So thank you for that plug. And again, we're very early on in, in the stages. So all of these organizations uh, we'll definitely have a conversation. I know our forestry division is really uh, uh, impacted by a lot of these things that happen. So they're very protective of uh, our natural species that we have in the park. So just wanted to add that, thanks. Thanks, Corey, you're a baller. <laughs> I, I, don't know, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'd like to call and add in, I, I noticed in the chat, uh, folks talking about, um, Things like preserving some of the flat areas for recreation, and I know so far the the conversations dominated more with like extreme uh, mountain biking, which is certainly one of the um, recreational um, considerations. But others that are you know less extreme, you know, I'm getting up there in the years, and I'm more on a, on the flat level. So yeah, we are looking for flatter, you know, reserving the flat areas also for the recreation. So we are also interested in the people who want to put in and, and you know, in, into the discussion and discourse as we move forward with the project on what those will be, you know, and how do we, how do, you know, the, the, the bicyclists, the uh, mountain bikers, walkers, dog walkers, and everybody all coexist and, and have a usable space. Okay, our next live question is from Sue Ann. Sue Ann, you have the floor. Thank you for uh, waiting so patiently, uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Sue Ann, are you there? We may have lost Sue Ann. We'll give it 
10 more seconds and then we'll switch back to addressing the questions in the Q&A. Okay, it doesn't look like Sue Ann is still on. So um, Sue Ann, if you uh, rejoin us, let us raise your hand and we'll give you a chance to ask your question. Um, so next up is a question. I believe this is addressed to Councilman O'Connor from Henry McKay. Councilman O'Connor mentioned finding a way to share the energy from the array with the community, or did we? Is this dependent on enabling legislation for community solar passing the General Assembly, or can it be done without legislation from the General Assembly? Yeah, we we just discussed that. Um, so I, I believe it would have to go through the General Assembly. I would love for it not to, um, but I think that's uh, what we would have to do because the PUC has oversight over things like this. So. Uh, we will double check and have that answer um, for the next meeting, but I, I would believe that it would have to go through the General Assembly to make those changes. I, I do know that as you're driving through a number of towns on your way to Harrisburg, actually, there are some solar farms set up right across, right on the highway. I know the airport just got one as well. So we will look into how they did that and, and if that goes to a community or just back to the grid, but that would obviously be part of the longer conversation. Um, next question. Um, has the city URA considered buying the Irish Center and turning it into some sort of nine mile run environmental center? Wow. And that's from uh, Christina Marie. That's an idea. Um, not to my knowledge. Uh, not for that purpose, no. Um, I know it, it was up for sale a while ago. I, I don't, there's some some uh, local residents that still own and operate it. Um, obviously, that's that's an option that's there. I know they, uh, the Irish Center did try to sell a, a couple of times. Um, I don't know what the status of the Irish Center is now. I believe this same group owns it and uh, they do have a, a committee and a lot of actual residents that live around here on that, that committee as well, but there's been no talk of that. If it's an open conversation and people are interested in that, um, you know, we would look at price and see how much that would cost the city and everything, but we, we could possibly be open to some type of idea like that. Great. And, uh, Apologies if some of these are duplicative, but I just want to make sure that every question is, or every question that we can't answer gets answered here. Jessica Wade asked, how will this project schedule work with the Parkway Bridge replacement? Do we anticipate any impact from that pro that other project that will be occurring? Yeah, yeah uh, we're not quite sure yet. That we, we've gotten some uh, initial discussion with the, with PennDOT and their consultants, and they're going to start construction 2023. As far as the details of the schedule, road closers, we're going to have to we're going to have to look at all that as we move forward with this. I mean, I would think um, you know at some point or other, uh, you know, the you know traffic through you know Commercial Road Forward Avenue is going to be disrupted. Although that'll be past kind of where you know our entrance point at the bottom of Commercial Road, you know, back up into the back side of the area. I don't I don't think would be um impacted we own the property there at at that you know where the current parking lot is now to the head of that that existing trail um we're, we're gonna have to work that out on on how that impacts you know our our, our plan okay um from erica we have this question do you anticipate any um, property value uh, impacts to existing homes in Somerset, uh, especially if you compare it to what was originally proposed as Somerset phase three? Like, would you expect property values to go up or down based on the presence of homes versus the presence of solar panels? 
That's a really good question. So, so it was the, the question is uh, by replacing this, would, would property values go up or down? The, I, I believe Erica is asking, so we originally were going to have Somerset phase three, which was a housing development. And now instead we'll be having solar panels. Do you, would, uh, like put another way, which would make property values go higher, solar panels or more houses? Uh, I mean, I, I would say that um, I, I'm not in the real estate agency, but I can take a crack at this. Um, you know, the property that goes for sale at Somerset has obviously increased property values around because the, the sales of those properties are at the high end point of affordability in the city of Pittsburgh. There are some are 600,000 to a million, depending on where you're at, um, at Somerset. Uh, I will say having amenities like parks um, by your house does add a value to your property. Um, overall, the tax base, uh, I do know that when we did Somerset phase three, we did bring in about 66% of those residents were not living in the city and now we're living in the city. I believe that site gives us maybe three to 5 million a year in tax revenue. I could be a little off on that. I haven't seen those numbers in a long time. Um, so I think it just depends on what you think quality is. I know that um, values of phase three, because the roads would not connect, and again, I'm not an expert in real estate, but the roads were never going to connect to Swiss Hound Park. So with those roads never connecting, I don't know how much the impact would have gone up. Um, but again, that was a choice that we as neighbors took to not have the roads connect. Um, so again, I'm not the expert, but I would say we, we probably would have added a little tax revenue, but at the end of the day, we're getting an extended park. And I think people really love their parks. And as regional assets, we gain a lot more as a neighborhood, as a community, by having additional park, green space, and with the addition of hopefully community solar, you will see a tax break in using those funds. So I hope I answered that as well as I could for not being a real estate agent. Uh, in a similar vein, um, I saw a question in the chat, and if I can find it before I ask it, I will uh, give credit where credit is due, but it has something to do with uh, glare and anticipated glare from solar panels. Do we anticipate any sort of glare from the solar panels or other sort of unexpected uh, visual or light impacts from the installation of solar panels? Yeah, um, this is a question that I think, you know, folks get a lot with solar panel development. Um, it's hard to say exactly what that glare point will look like based on kind of like the angle of where you're viewing it from. Um, you know, it's our understanding there are a lot of kind of communities that are looking over onto this land. And so we understand that it's a concern um, I can't, what I can speak to now is that there are, you know, some efforts that can be taken and have been taken in the past as related to kind of shielding the solar panels um, from certain viewpoints um, in terms of kind of having, you know, some trees on the exterior of the, where the panels are and that type of thing. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's difficult to say exactly what the glare point will be from like any, you know, certain angle, but I think that, you know, that's something that the, the developers would be able to speak to, I think, a little bit better than, than we can at this time. Um, Paul, I'm not sure if you have something to add there. No, that's pretty much it. I mean, I'd, I'd also consider they're going to face, they'll face south, so that's kind of toward, toward the river, so that, that's kind of toward the um, you know, away from the, the direct neighborhoods, if, if, if that makes sense. Um, but then again, as you, you know, as the sun makes its way across the sky, just what those, where those points are and where it reflects it. And again, I think the developer is going to be the one that has to answer that as we get closer on just how they're, how they manage glare. Okay. Um, I think we mentioned, or I think this kind of got addressed, but 
Uh, will some dead end streets become open throughways? I believe we answered that and said that there's that's not going to be the case, but I'll let the experts uh, weigh in on that one from Helene. Yeah, so I mean, I think going based off feedback that Councilman O'Connor mentioned about the housing development, it's our understanding that folks don't want to see any type of throughway off of you know the existing street grid. Um, and so therefore any access like vehicular access road uh, for the development of the actual site will be routed, um, you know, as we're theorizing the plans through commercial um, rather than, you know, those heavy trucks and whatnot coming through the, the neighboring kind of street grid there. Um, I think part of the question for everyone else today um, in, in the community at large is, you know, do folks want to see trail access from the existing street grid? And if so, you know, what streets are folks, what, what are the most desirable streets for that? Um, do people have concerns about trail access um, from the existing street grid? I think those are some of the questions that we're, we're really looking to the community um, to help us understand the desire there. Yeah, I, I would just add that, yeah, connecting, uh, we've heard for a number of years, and we're all supportive not to connect. Um, I think uh, an issue that's going to pop up, I know it pops up on our dead ends right now, is people that, that park it in, the in our streets and then, you know, jump onto the trail somewhere. So I think you're never, ever going to stop that. I mean, people can park in certain areas, it's public, public roads, but I think when we look and have these longer community meetings about the main entrance points, where the trails are going to go, um, keep in mind that I think the, the bulk of parking we should keep towards commercial um, so that there aren't a number of cars flying through our neighborhood streets, creating other problems like that. So I think when we have the longer conversation about what this ultimately looks like, um, pushing as many cars towards where they park now uh, would be very important. So I, I think that's gonna be a neighborhood conversation uh, for entry points and things like that. Uh, and still remaining to have that buffer from the end houses on the street to the to Frick Park is really something nice that a lot of residents like. So it'll be a longer conversation, but that, that's definitely a concern that we've heard as well. Yeah, and I think I, I just wanted to mention, um, Daniel's gonna help me move to kind of, this is the, how you can, how your feedback can inform the process slide. Um, and I, I've, I've listed a couple questions here. I also wanna reiterate um, to everyone that, you know, there is gonna be more time to, to give feedback. Um, we will have a feedback form that we'll be reviewing responses for um, until the end of October. Um, and I just wanted to mention that, you know, initially we had the feedback form due October 15th and we heard feedback from the community that said, hey, that's not enough time. So we've extended it um, another couple of weeks here. Um, I'm gonna put the feedback form link in the chat again. Um, and I just wanna, you know, again, reiterate that please, you know, take some time to fill that out. Um, if we weren't able to get to your comment or question today, um, there is an open comment section um on you know that form so you can feel free to list anything that you're interested in sharing there um and as well as you know these are some of the the questions here that will really help us inform you know what that that design or that rfp um should look like and, and we do have about 10 more minutes so we can take maybe one or two more questions here um this question from matt roth is sort of uh alluded to in other questions about, um, you know, why solar panels now, what's being considered for the site. Um, so why not develop the entire area as a Frick Park extension? The open space is so close to the city. And, uh, sorry, I lost my spot. The open space so close to the city is already a valuable option too. Solar can be built in other places, but, uh, park space cannot. And sort of piggybacking off of that, there were a couple other questions about why the uh, phase three of Somerset didn't go forward and why we pivoted to a uh, solar uh, generation site. Yeah, sure. So um, 
maybe the I'll start with the the latter question about the pivot here. Um, and so, really, I think you know there were some some major costs um, and like gaps in the the, the development um, kind of budget for the Somerset Phase Three housing concept that really just couldn't be bridged. Um, no pun intended, considering one of those um, design challenges is the bridge that was considered for a cross, you know, nine mile run bridging the two, the, the existing Somerset site with um, what was planned for, for the third phase, um, as well as utility connections, um, regrading, like some of those costs, there was, there was a gap that was basically too, too high to fill. And I think for the last, you know, multiple years since this was initially proposed, uh, we've been kind of trying to crunch the numbers and figure out how we could make it work, but um, we've come to the point where, you know, we have to say, you know, it's it's no longer feasible. Um, I mean, we kind of have to close the gap or close the book on that on that concept and and move forward with with another option. Um, I think in terms of developing the entirety of the site as as um, you know Frick Park um, extension. Um, I think that, you know, there, there are areas, it's really kind of an issue of what, what kind of um, responsibility the city is willing to take versus the URA versus other stakeholders who are involved in that um, and, and, and that decision and the ability to really maintain the entirety of that land. Um, and so I think that that's where some of the challenges come in for who, who is able, what entity is able to take that like larger responsibility for the maintenance um, and you know the, the care for the entirety of that property. So I think breaking it down into sections, you know, in theory, um, and taking some of it, you know, off of that larger whole makes it a little bit more palatable um, for you know the city to potentially be able to take on part of the space as as a Frick Park um, extension. I'm not sure if Councilman O'Connor, you want to add any texture to that or Paul, um, but I might leave it there. Uh, no, I, I mean, I thought the overall answer, yeah, that, that's that's a good answer for why Somerset at phase three just uh, wasn't fitting uh, at this time. And I did see some questions. I don't know if we get to them, but um, yeah, we do have to look at capital funding for this project down the road as well, uh, not just solar but when we talk about the trails and things like that there will have to be budget requests um, from the city um, to build to build trails to our specs as well as support the infrastructure that's already there so th there is going to be a cost when we get into funding um, the extension of Frick Park and uh, building new trails for everybody as well so there there is some funding I saw that in a couple of the questions also Um, sort of piggybacking off of that, JBC asked if phase three of the Somerset at Frick development was to include a low income affordable housing component, and if that, um, and if, if so, if the low income housing in as intended in development three is lost with a developer be willing to contribute to that sort of development in the area? So that's another question as to why we're looking at a change. Um, when you're talking about affordability in the city of Pittsburgh, we are one of the only cities that have an affordable housing trust fund um, that raises $10 million. We're gonna try to get even more out of that to help people with you know, first time homeowners. Um, when developers look at building uh, apartments or things like that. Actually, uh, the Poli site is a great example of if you get some public resources and public funding that a uh, certain level of affordability has to be in. So we are making our city affordable um, when it comes to even helping people with rent and things like that. That all goes into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. There was never a time during Somerset phase one, two, or three. Uh, well, I, should, I wasn't here for one and one, but um, during phase three, there was never a time where any of these properties were going to be affordable. So uh, there would be no recourse for the developer because uh, they were not using any uh, 
any of their resources on affordable housing. Um, I believe if we would have gone through with this phase and got public uh, investment, public dollars, then there would obviously be a percentage of affordable housing. But in this case, there was nothing planned for affordable housing, um, which is why we've been pushing the trust fund and uh, working with developers that do uh, affordable housing. If you've gone to where Polis used to be and where the movie theater was, that's going to be another 40 plus units of affordable housing um, in Squirrel Hill on a bus line. So, you know, when you're looking at affordable housing, it's not only where it's located, or well, it, it is beneficial of where it's located for public transit as well. So when we look to developers that want to do affordable housing, we take all of that in. But at no point was there ever affordable housing plan for phase three at all. Okay, and this question comes from, I believe, Amanda Weed. Um, when construction begins on the site, do we know how access to the construction site will, through what route that uh, access will be given, or is it too soon to know that? No, it's not too soon. Um, the way we're envisioning it now is access for the construction of the site um, will be routed through commercial. So again, to Councilman O'Connor's um, comments earlier about um, keeping you know, development here off of the existing street grid and neighboring street get, grid, um, that's still the, the kind of priority as we're envisioning it. Um, is to you know keep those kind of larger vehicles involved in the construction um, away from kind of Swiss Elm Park area and in the residential area and, and down by commercial instead. Um, Paul, you look like you're you want to say something you want to add in there? Yeah, as you talked about that, I was looking through the, the comments and the um, and that connectivity. Um, we're gonna we're gonna look at that so that we can we can do as. Um, the least amount of deforestation to get that that in, um, maybe including was considering, you know, not to get too much into technical details, is the existing trail and somehow using that as the temporary, you know, temporary access getting into that and also making the connectivity up the hill, which now, is, I mean, your mountain bike connections have made kind of theirs, but as far as other recreation, um, you know, something a little, little gentler sloped, um, for the connection, but um, it may interrupt that trail for a bit to get construction, but otherwise we wouldn't have to sacrifice, you know, the, um, the urban forest we have. So, so we are, the gears are turned on trying to figure that out. Um, just one other comment as I read through the questions, there's a, there's a whole lot here and a whole lot of things. Um, uh, great ideas. We love the feedback is the, the overall connectivity, you know, which I hadn't quite been thinking of, and we hadn't been discussing, you know, between between our team right now, is the commuter kind of co connectivity through the area that connects down through Duck Hollow and onto the trails and on downtown that, you know, people would be using this actually as bike commuter route. Um, very good points um, and, and worth considering as we move, move through this. Um, really like the idea, um, rather than it just being strictly recreation and it's also multi multimodal transportation to work so thank you for those comments yeah and I, I know we're coming up on time here and we do have a hard stop at 8 30 um but daniel if you could go to the next slide um it will just share the contact info for paul and myself um, I want to tell folks, you know, again, this is not the only opportunity we're going to have to give feedback. We've got three other community meetings um, that we absolutely hope you'll attend, um, as well as the feedback form, which again, I can put the link in the chat here one more time uh, for folks. Um, that's a place where you can, you know, share feedback as well. Um, yeah, any direct questions, you know, this is my email on the screen here, alfredman at ura.org. Um, my office line there as well. So feel free to get in touch. Um, I think, you know, we're really going to be looking to collect feedback um, in the next month or so to help help inform, you know, how the RFP is going to be written up. And we look forward to, um, you know, meeting with you with you again. And once once the RFP is kind of written up and pre release, um, as well as I want to mention that um, this uh, recording of this meeting will be available on the URA website. Um, so 
feel um, feel free to you know tune in there if you missed it. Share this with folks. Share the feedback form. Um, and and yeah, again, thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to hearing from you more as as this process progresses. Yeah, thank thank you everyone for coming. I saw that the um, the participation number was up to a hundred. So uh, wow, it's a lot of a lot of people interested and, and glad to have you participate. Yeah, I just end with thank you. Thank uh, you know Paul, Lily, uh, Dan for helping us out as well. The U, the whole URA. So thank you guys very much. Uh, we will be in contact. Um, if, if you don't have my email, it's corey.oconnor at pittsburghpa.gov. Um, obviously, you can just come down the street, knock on my door, ask me any questions. Um, but uh, let us know uh, what we can do in the future. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you.